Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 477th episode of Constructed Chrism. I'm your host, Mason. I'm joined by my co-host, Abe Stein. Abe, how you doing? I missed y'all so much. And not y'all, Mason, because Spencer is unfortunately not here. But y'all, the listeners, it's been so long, I feel like. It's been like maybe like two, three weeks or something, but... It just feels like forever. Yeah, you know, it was, I think, most of September there. But, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, life goes that way. And just like Spencer being out this week, sometimes you just got to go for a little while. And, you know, you always come back around. Yeah, I mean, I would suggest to everyone out there, don't get sick. Don't yeah. do it. Yeah, catching COVID, not Play around. quite it. Well, speaking of not being it, not being it is not working on always improving. That is the main point of the show. And, Abe, you've been out for a couple of weeks, so I'm going to let you sort of go first. What has been your always improving moment over these last couple of weeks? Yes, yeah, so these last couple of weeks, I've actually been um, really reacclimating to modern. I haven't had some time to play RCQs, uh, so I've been kind of out of the loop. And also, since Lord of the Rings, I've been keeping up with the format, but actually getting the reps in has been had been a bit hard. But being able to prioritize, giving myself time to do that, and trying out decks also off of like the you know, off the beaten path of what I'm used to. So playing, um, you know, like a good amount of Cauldron Yawgmoth and a pretty good amount of Cauldron uh, Scales. Actually, I'm currently working on. It's pretty interesting. I'm playing some Scales. Wait, like you're this. also on Scales right now. I'm giving it a shot. I'm giving it a shot. I think uh, I think it's got some issues, but I uh, also think that it just seems like it could be well positioned. I think mm-hmm. it like lines up pretty well against a lot of the. Uh, the stronger things in the format going on. And I think Urza Saga decks in general are pretty good into grief decks. So just trying it out. I, I, it's been a while since I've sleeved up an Arkbound Ravager and I love, love me some Arkbound Rav. So I, uh, I was perhaps treating myself a bit, but I also just in general have been uh, trying to, to expand and broaden my horizons again before I probably ultimately get into playing some more scam and, uh, and or like four color beanstalk as hammer is not really lining up too well against things these days. Sure. It's really interesting that the hammer stuff, because it's like your four color matchup, I think is like really rough and all the force of vigor decks are like really rough. And then there's just like a lot of decks I think are pretty good matchups for you. Like a uh, scam, for example, which I don't know, maybe you disagree on, uh, which would be an interesting conversation topic, but just in general, I feel like, hammer overperforms a little bit at like rcqs and stuff just because it is such a punishing deck if you misplay against it and it rewards skill so much that like when people who played a ton of hammer pick up hammer for rcqs they typically do really well because it is so taxing on the opponent you know yeah i think um also like the reasons that i'm kind of shying away from hammer right now are that a, I think the hive mind has kind of lost its way a bit, or maybe I disagree with the people who are kind of leading the charge at the top, and I haven't really had the time to put in the work to, to change things up. Um, but B, if you look at the matchups that you're most afraid of, it's like Amulet, which means that for it to be bad at your RCQ, for that to like matter at your RCQ level, there has to be like Amulet players who are, you know, good Amulet players and will be winning matches with the deck in your area. I think Scam is fine i'm not really excited about it. i think bowmasters and just a lot of things have made esper sentinel specifically worse than it has been in a bit uh and so like that's one of your best cards now a little bit weaker i think the yawgmoth matchup's pretty bad and that deck has only gotten stronger and the four color decks coming back is just kind of like the the final death knell for i've seen a lot a lot of beanstalk in my area so that's mm-hmm. kind of like why I'm away from it, but it's still, it's still, you know, a strong deck. And I, I, I'm starting to understand like the thought processes behind like things like the solitudes. If you're worried about playing against the like amulet decks and stuff like that, and playing uh, like a bunch of Marius calls to support them. But I'm pretty concerned about the fundamental issue of like our best, or maybe like best cards, but like the third or second best cards, like our best turn one plays. For Hammer are just getting worse, and like the things that make the deck kind of stand out in the games where it gets interacted with are getting weaker, and uh, a lot of the things that are happening in the format are just inherently stronger against your games that aren't going perfectly. So that's that's my two cents. 
No, that, I think that's really reasonable. I, I know that I personally have been like cutting Esper Sentinels and moving them to the sideboard, which is like maybe a little bit of heresy, but I also haven't been playing Solitude, so I've kind of a little bit of space, and I've just been playing like a lot of Giver of Runes uh, to sort of address the fact that Esper Sentinel isn't great as like laterally across the format as it was a couple months ago. And when it's good, I kind of have it. You know what I mean? Um, but I don't know if that's like the best way to approach it. It's just a thing I've been doing. And so I, I agree. Yeah. That I think the force figure decks just are problems and Yogg and Amulet are two of the yeah. big contenders. Yeah. I think if I was going to not to make this the, you know, the hammer show for, for a little bit, but uh, I think if I was, season, you know, yeah. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure some people have been, have been waiting. I've been, out, I've been out for a month. Let's uh, let, let's give it to him. But the uh, yeah, I think that Giver is in a really good spot. I think like the two toughest creatures are good, um, but I think that it hurts your uh, your artifact count for um, Pure Steel Paladin in a pretty meaningful way. So I would probably lean into um, playing more Springleaf Drums, more mana sources that are turn one plays that avoid getting like Furied or Bowmastered. Um, have more explosive turn twos, and you probably also just need to lean in more on uh, what is it, Forge New? Even yeah. though I'm not certain the card is like you're going to be getting the best out of it, um, I think it's probably going to be a good draw in your stand matchups because they're likely going to be priced in taking a hammer or something. Um, but also, it's going to be something you can power out with your mana advantage or use like, right, you're going to need more ways to use more of your equips rather than kind of counting on having Metalcraft all the time, when it feels like that's going to be a little bit harder to do if Esper Sentinel is something you're moving away from. Um, yes. I'm not sure how that all really plays into, into beating four color, but I think it's a start. I think that I think the giver is is a start, and more drums is is definitely a part of that, too. I'm a, I, I, anyone who knows I'm a big drum fan anyway. So Yeah, I, you, you've described my deck. I have three drums, an extra land, and two Forge News in the main and one on the side. And I do think Forge News help a lot against the four-color matchup because the moving at instant speed makes it so once you get something equipped up, uh, even if it can't attack that turn on the next turn, the Solitudes and the Leyland Binding... Like, Leyland Binding is a bit of a problem on the Hammer proper, but, like, Solitude-type cards suddenly aren't as big a deal because now you can be moving around at instant speed and having, you know... Multiple uh, Forge News in your deck means that that card is just top down beat Force of Vigor, right? Like, it seems to me, it seems pretty overt that that's like the goal of that card in design was to beat up on Force of Vigor. So, having it in the main deck makes a lot of sense. And I agree that it's harder to have the artifact count. So, then it's harder to turn on your Pure Steel Paladin. So, you need to have more equippers and et cetera, et cetera. And so, I don't know. There, there's a lot we could talk about. Uh, and maybe that's like, I don't know, like a Patreon thing that we can talk in the Discord about a little bit. Um, if you're interested in that, because I don't want to harp on Hammer forever, like you mentioned. Um, I, I think Hammer's fine. I don't know. I, I think if you told me I had to play Hammer for my RCQ, it wouldn't be my pack one pick one. But I'd be pretty confident I could win an RCQ with Hammer. Yeah, I mean, I and and I might still play it. The thing is, every time I look, I'm like, all right, let's 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 get down to it. I'm like, oh, this is actually, for me to want to play Hammer and, and feel great about my deck list, I feel like I'm going to spend probably like a week or so of like my, my evenings, plus maybe a little bit more getting everything lined up and trying out things and I just haven't had time to do it. But I, I think that No, that's I think that's really reasonable. So my always improving I, I mentioned you've also been playing scales because you and I haven't really talked that much outside of the show. Um which means we haven't talked much about on the show. Uh I've been playing hardened scales. Uh because I basically was like I thought I get the soul cauldron is really strong. I mentioned it on uh the set review. Um and ever since I've seen that card I've been really like, wow, this card's really good. I'm kind of anxious about it. It seems really good. And I've been playing Yawgmoth some, and I was like, dang, I always, like, I, and you, I'm sure Abe can attest to this. For, like, the last year, every now and again, I'm like, I'm going to play some Hardened Scales. And I go to play Hardened Scales, and my brain just, like, doesn't want to do it, and I just melt. I'm like, God, I think this deck is better than everyone else does. I just think it's too hard to play, but it's just kind of not worth it, right? Like, there's so many other things going on. I think Agatha Soul Cauldron is the thing that kind of helps make it worth it, and... I do think there are a lot of problems, and maybe this is like we can spend a couple minutes talking about that. Eight, but like one of the biggest ones I've been trying to solve is there are just so many two drops, <laughs> and your curve is like you know it's kind of flat, ninety degrees straight up on twos, and then kind of flat again. Um, you know, and that is not the greatest place to be. Uh, I've been trying to play extra gemstone caverns to kind of make up for that, but that has its own problems. Um, and I think the deck is really strong. I think it is unreal hard. 
um, as has Yawgmoth been. I accidentally stumbled upon a new kill, actually, yesterday, Abe, where I was playing against Hammer, and I was in a bad spot, and then I realized I had Walvoots and Walking Ballista under my Cauldron. And so my Young Wolf, I could shoot them, and then put a minus O minus one to make a mana, and then it would die, and then it would come back and I could shoot them, and I was like, oh, you're dead. I didn't realize you were <laughs> dead. Yeah. And, then, and it was just like, there's been a bunch of stuff like that, like every time I play Cauldron, because the cards interact in such bizarre ways compared to normal right um and it, it's just been really taxing and really hard but really rewarding and i really like pushing myself about i guess it's almost a year and a half ago now i just was like i think i have a decent understanding of yog but not a great one and i wanted to fix that and i got to the point where i felt like i could easily win an rcq playing yog and i still sort of feel that way even though it's very hard to play um and I just don't like that I don't feel that way about Hardened Scales. You know, it's like, we mentioned this a couple of times now, but it's like, if you told me I had to play Hardened Scales, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I am going to be barely able to probably top eight this event right now. You know what I mean? Like, at least consistently, if we were to play a thousand tournaments or whatever. So I, I want to fix that. And that's what my uh, my time has been going in that department. Yeah. I, can I, just, I think Scales is a terrible Soul Cauldron deck. Is my feeling on it. There's only like one thing. I want actively to put under a soul cauldron the way the decks are currently built. And so it feels like there's a tension between it being an automaton deck and being like a scale, like a cauldron deck. Mm -hmm. I think it's not really leaning into either very well by putting more two drops in, into itself. And then like, you're not really great to boss decks. You only have two modular cards. You're not really getting the most out of that. Um, like I, I've been having quite a bit of crisis of, of, like, how much of this deck being good is it, like, the new cards supporting it? And how much is it that just, like, Scales has been good and now people are playing it more? And I'm leaning more towards being that Scales is just good enough to, like, be a played deck. The interaction is currently not that great against Scales. Mm -hmm. um, like, the format is just not... I mean, in the same way with, like, with Hammer with Cigar Eight or whatever, like, mm -hmm. playing a Scales on turn one, just, like, Time walks a lot of opponents and also makes all of your cards off the top a lot better. And then Raptor plus that is also good. But I just haven't, I don't know if you felt this, but I felt that like there's only like two things I ever actually want under my cauldron. And that is Haywire Might and Ballista. I'm not like ever too interested in like, because. My creatures don't have modular already, except for maybe Zabaz. So, like, it it being an Arcbound Ravager doesn't really help. Um, and the games don't really play out in a way often, at least in my experience, where I get to be like, oh, yeah, this one mana Arcbound Ravager uh, that also has, like, you know, works with these modular things is, like, pretty cool. But, like, being a scales deck is pretty nice. So, um, like, it might just be better to kind of stop being as cute and put, I guess in my opinion, stop being as cute and just put, like, more Arcbound workers in your deck and lean into more, like, of modular stuff and just, like, what makes the deck strong. It's gotten quite a few cards, you know, one at a time to make it that way. And, like, there's always going to be things that are, like, head hurdy because of Ozolith plus the amount of scales you have plus, like, you know, how Zabaz right? and Ravager and, and, a, and a Hangerback Walker and it's, like, how, how much, how many counters can I really make? Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's definitely another different kind of puzzle, and and it's it's really fun to play. I think that like, it, it's just a good, it's like a pretty good deck. But I the the mana situation again, not not the best. And Springleaf Drum doesn't even solve it. That's the real problem. Springleaf Drum solves so many problems in so many different Arkham Raptor decks of like, oh, I need some more artifacts and also some more mana sources, and I, I'm playing a bunch of cheap creatures. But all your stuff costs two, so you can't even be like. I'll play the drum on one and then my two drop and my one drop. You're like, I have no more one drop. So yeah, I, uh, done a little bit of that. I cut some patchwork automatons and added a arc bound worker, um, to try and help with that a little bit. But obviously one is not, you know, like, Oh, the ship's perfectly balanced now, you know? So I definitely have felt some of that. I guess my last quick question to you is how many soul cauldrons are you playing? Playing, uh, one of the challenges had two soul cauldrons. Okay. Um, and it's been like 
fine. It's just like when I'm playing the, the Yawgmoth Cauldron deck, I was like, oh, this is like a Cauldron deck. When I like have Cauldron, I'm like, I'm using it as a cheap way to enable the most powerful things in my deck mm-hmm. to to happen. And my plan A is already really strong, so it's like giving me a cheap way to like really force things through. Like when my Yawgmoth gets killed, I'm able to draw much cards, find a Cauldron, and then. Be like, all right, Cauldron my Yogg. Now I just have a Yogg in play like all the time. And also I've opened up like two turns now I've opened up a million different crazy kills. Because if I like find my Ballista, like I can cord for zero, put the Ballista in the yard, like activate it. And I have like Young Wolf Blood Artist. It's over. You know, like it, these things just can happen. But in scales, it's like much less of that. There's not really, there's not really, you're not building an engine. Uh, with your cauldron and scales, and I think that's kind of the problem. And I haven't looked deep into Scryfall to figure out like what the engine I would try to build is, but I feel like there's got to be one out there for for it to really take off in a way that it's like a good cauldron deck. Because right now cauldron is just fine, is is my feeling. But yeah, I, I it have... should be a good. It should be like cauldron so strong that if it's not, you're not making a really strong cauldron deck. Then what's the point? No, that's fair. I, I have uh, only one cauldron in my deck. Um, in the scales, because I, I sort of agree that, like, I think scales is just a good deck. But like I mentioned before, I, I keep thinking scales is a good deck, and I just don't put the work in. And I think it's just, like, so hard to play, and people just bounce off it because of how hard to play it is. And my guess is it has been, like, as good as Yawgmoth has been in the metagame, if maybe not better, for, like, months now. And I just think having a scales in your deck goes a long way. But, uh, you know... Uh, I'm sorry, a, a, hard, uh, a cauldron in your hard and scales deck, excuse me. Um, but I agree, yeah, Yawgmoth is like a cauldron deck, and I have like three cauldrons, I'm like, dang, should I play four cauldrons in this deck? It's so good. Uh, and I think that's too much. But regardless, I, I agree that there's some definitely issues going on that got to get worked down. Hopefully as people keep playing it, we'll sort of solve it, because uh, there's just a lot more eyes in the deck now, and that will help it. Well, that was your modern 15 minutes. You know, Abe, a lot of people complained we didn't talk about Hammer last week on the episode of Modern Breakdown because it didn't score enough points. So we gave him that. We gave him a little scales. And let's give him a good episode here on tempo and break that down. But before that, just a reminder that the show will always be free. But if you want to support it, you can go to patreon.com slash ccmtg. The show will always be free, but that is a way to get back. There's a pretty active Discord community of sort of like-minded, improving people. You know, that's like a we talked about before, but we had to keep Mohan channel that's pretty active. All of the formats are fairly active. Even standards getting a little bit of buzz now, Abe, which kind of blows my mind. Players are excited for the RCQ season, myself included. You know, I, I just moved uh, last week, and so when we get back to the video podcast, you'll see a new background behind me. But my new LGS is starting up standard Abe, and I'm just like please don't put it on Monday. Please, that's when I do the podcast. Any other night I can make it work, you know, but just not Monday. And so, uh, you know, people are excited and there's a lot of stuff going on there and a lot of conversation about all the formats. So if you're looking for like-minded people about always improving and want to support the show, it's a great way to do it. Um, But now that we're done with that, Abe, let's talk about our main topic, which is in our series of archetypes. And this one is tempo. Uh, Abe, how would you define tempo for the listeners? Yeah, this is something we talk about uh, on a few other episodes of the show, but it's always a good refresher when we're going to talk about a bunch of tempo decks. But tempo, uh, at least we, you and I agree, is best defined as uh, when you are exchanging your cards uh, in exchange for your opponent's time. So you are trying to make it so your opponent is accomplishing less and making less headway into you know, impacting the board and impacting, you know, the, the resource exchanges going on, but that's coming at the cost of your own cards. So you're spending like a classic tempo spell would be like unsummoning your opponent's creature in, in a draft, right? They spend, they spend six mana on a colossal dread maw and you unsummon it. That's plus five mana. Cause they got to spend six mana or you spent one mana. They have to spend six mana again uh, to get that card back down. And you have all the time to use the rest of that mana, even though it doesn't really um, answer it. Or, you know, cards like Aethergust, putting something on top of the library, denying that draw step. Um, those those are things that really are classic tempo at their core, where you're taking away parts of your opponent's turn and, and what they're trying to accomplish and keeping them from gaining headway. Um, although usually without actually getting a card. Yeah, you're, you're sort of, I, I love... You know that this. I don't. I feel like tempo is so hard to define, but I do love that one that you and you and I at least agree on. Uh, and 
I think it's important to note that sort of what we're getting at is you are not actually like if there's nothing going on on your side of the board, you're not really getting anywhere, right? Like when you uh, fading hope or vapor snag, sort of the card that got people to start looking at tempo decks. If you vapor snag something, all you've really done is sort of waste their time if you don't have anything going. And, you know, especially with a card like that where it doesn't even put it on top of the deck, right? At least Aether Gust sort of both players are, you know, if you're not, if I'm not doing anything, you didn't really change anywhere. So I got another draw step out of it. But an actual unsummon effect, nothing's really changing, right? Unless I'm making something change. So that's why these tempo decks typically uh, use these kind of cards because they combine them with cheap threats to hit your opponent for a lot. And they sort of walk the line between aggro and like all in aggro and sort of a uh, mid rangey aggro deck where they're kind of like more aggressive, but they do try to interact a little bit in order to kill you quickly and are basically not worried about actually beating all the cards you have because they're going to kill you so quickly that it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, just a big shout out to uh, Drafting Archetypes, uh, another show on the network, with Sam Black. Something that he talks about a lot on. Um, on that show is the tempo to attrition spectrum um, where if you're looking at, and this is specifically in, in terms of draft deck where, you know, things are a lot less powerful than they are constructed, you know, decks are a lot less streamlined, but typically, you know, if you're looking at what your deck is trying to accomplish, there's two ways really that games of uh, draft specifically tend to end. And, you know, on one end of the spectrum is uh, attrition where, Everyone uses all their resources, and it's really about who's going to be able to spend more mana over the course of this long, drawn-out game and still have cards and spells to keep on casting and using the, that mana on to keep on generating advantage. Um, or the other end of it, which is tempo, where um, a player is going to make it so the game doesn't get to that stage, and they're going to use all of their resources before uh, the other player has a chance to deploy all of theirs, and that's going to snowball into their win. And so when you're really, you know, talking about tempo uh, decks in constructed, you know, everything is much more streamlined. And so uh, you really have to be getting under the format and generating, you, you have to have like a mix of not only uh, the pressure to back up the time you're able to generate, but the tools to generate, um, you know, the right amount of time. Uh, and yeah, you know, historically there's not, because of that, it, it takes like a really special mix of cheap interaction and cheap threats, all in the same colors that are supported by the mana. And that can be like a big ask, but when it has existed, it tends to be, you know, really, really strong. So you're playing things that are, you know, on rate good, right? Efficient cards of your own um, and using those to, like, in conjunction with soft interaction to have a strong enough game plan to, to take it late. And that usually... Uh, you know, that's kind of a dangerous combination to have, and it doesn't always come together. But when it does, it's usually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, double spelling is typically one of the strongest things you can be doing in Magic, and these decks excel at that. Some tempo decks you might know historically to sort of give some context to what we're talking about. If we were to look at the current day, uh, Pioneer, Blue Spirits, Blue White, or Mono Blue sort of both fall into this deck. And then in Modern, Rhinos, if you're more of a modern player. And, you know, I think we've talked enough about Modern right now, but we'll get to Rhinos in a second. But looking at pioneer blue spirits it really does sort of look like the traditional like okay i've got a bunch of cheap creatures uh my creatures have a little bit of annoyance and evasion to them right basically every card in that deck has flying uh except for like mutavolt uh and you know you just sort of attack your opponent and you sort of invalidate some of their plays because normally you know decks like mono green when i play my old growth troll that's supposed to stop you from attacking me but it doesn't work here so you can let cards like that resolve and then you use your counter magic in order to fight over the few things that actually do matter right and this is sort of why we've seen pioneer spirits do so well against certain decks like lotus field mono green uh creativity because those decks are all trying to resolve one or two big clunky cards and this sort of like, I'm going to apply quick pressure with good disruption is a masterpiece against those decks because they sort of fall apart and they're not built for battling those kind of things. And then when you see decks like Rakdos play against them, they have cheap interaction and threats and sort of can play a very similar game, right? Um, and be like, oh, well, I've got a cheap threat and I've got some things to interact with your stuff and, you know, let's game. So that is sort of one tempo deck there. And then if you look at Modern Rhinos, um, that deck is trying to very quickly 
uh, interact a little bit on the early turns, you know, with things like Fire Ice and Dead Gone, ideally, but for the most part, doesn't have much. And then puts into play the Rhinos and then protects it with cards like Force Negation, Subtlety, Mystical Dispute, etc. These very cheap interaction spells uses things like Fury and Force of Vigor also so that it can kind of sort of have this huge swing on the game, right? Like, hey, on my turn three, I put in these Rhinos, you go for your Hammer Kill, I blow up the two things of Force of Vigor, etc. Or like you set up your Chalice plus another thing and then I blow those up and slam the Rhinos. All of these sort of play patterns happen and then you protect them and you're throwing away a lot of cards in order to quickly kill your opponent, right? This is why traditionally Rhinos have struggled against decks like Four Color because Four Color can survive the early onslaught and then once an Omnath gets down, it sort of gains enough life to invalidate these exchanges you've made, right? Whereas, you know, there are other decks where Rhinos just sort of runs them over because they're trying to resolve one big thing, right? A good example of this is actually kind of like Tron and Pine, I'm sorry, Tron and Modern, where subtlety, if you have a bunch of subtleties, a bunch of fortune negations, and Blood Moons post board, that's just a lot of things that provide a lot of tempo in that matchup, and you just run them over. And that's kind of, you know, when we're talking about uh, tempo decks, these are some good examples to think about going forward. Yeah, and I think um, to kind of understand, you know, what we mean by tempo deck, because those are two pretty different decks we ask most people, right? And I think that a lot of people, when they think about tempo, they think about the, like, cheap blue creatures with evasion, um, you know, some counter magic, some card draw. But if you look at both decks structurally, right, what are they both trying to accomplish? They're both trying to, uh, you know, get a clock on board um, that's going to close the game before their opponent can... Uh, like push through the fact that right their, your opponent's cards are probably better and stronger if they have the chance to resolve, but we're not giving them that time, and we're taking we're creating a window and creating a clock, and we're trying to close that on the opponent um, with the the soft interaction we have right. Like spell pierce is such a classic, you know, tempo kind of counter spell, especially in like standard and pioneer where. You know, when you spell pierce something, especially late in the game, you feel amazing because it's like, wow, they spent such like they spent all of turn five trying to cast that Teferi Hero of Dominaria, and now that thing is in the bin because I paid one blue. And now that's such a sick exchange. But then, you know, if they were able to wait two more turns, because you don't have the right kind of clock, your spell pierce now does nothing, right? It's it's not a, a card that matters. And so as the game kind of ages out, um, some of your cards get worse, but because your threats are able to keep the game condensed, the tempo deck creates. Um, the scenario where you can trade your cards that are, you know, weaker or spend all of them trying to win in just this one stage. And and I think Rhinos is pretty similar where, you know, just about every competitive deck in modern can do something stronger than making two four fours with trample. Um but the fact it's doing it for three mana and can do it at instant speed, uh, and the speed of that clock in the format, along with the fact that you know, you can play all of this interaction where you're sure you're two for one yourself to like have all these pitch spells um, and like you're going down on cards, but you know that your threats, the power, the raw power of them are going to take advantage of those. Like you're going to give a small enough time frame where it doesn't matter. You've given yourself this card disadvantage to uh, be able to take these exchanges to deny what your opponent's spending their mana on they're still not going to get to use all of their cards and all of their resources. And you're still going to come out you know, ahead and winning the game because your clock was fast enough. And so um, just thinking about kind of tempo in the sense of putting, uh, right, ending the game before your opponent gets to do what it is they need to do or be enter their, like, their operating and end game stage of like, oh, yeah, my deck's firing on all cylinders. That's really what the tempo decks are trying to do. And both of these, I think, are really great examples of using the interaction available even if it's not perfect, right? Even if it's not, uh, you know, the best interaction available. Like a card like Counterspell is better than Force Negation most of the time in the current format because it's more about having the right answer than having the answer and being able to do it for free. But, you know, Rhinos is willing to pay the cost of two for one itself to also be able to make two four fours in one turn um, because you're only going to have like three more turns from there as the opponent. And so it can it can afford that loss and the same vein, like spirits doesn't really care that it's creatures are weaker because the only way really stopping them is another reach creature. And maybe, you know, uh, rattle chains and, uh, and shackle geist 
you know, combined, they're going to make it so your removal spells, sure, eventually you'll draw an answer for the creatures that matter, but if I'm able to counter enough of those things, you'll take the chip shots in the air, and uh, and even though you would draw out of it, you're not going to have that chance. Um, I think it's just important to remember that, like, really, those are two different examples of the same deck-building philosophy that exist within two completely different formats with completely different interaction, completely different rules of engagement, but both are trying to define a window under what the opponent's trying to do and, and squeezing through it with their, with their like interaction. And I think when you think about what for yourself, like what makes a tempo deck or is my deck tempo deck or is, you know, is there room for a tempo deck to be successful? You have to think of what are the games like and is there room, is there a window here that I can kind of squeak through if I build my deck in, in a way to do it? Um, and, and I think that when you think about the role of the tempo deck, that's what it is. is it, it's there to, to take advantage of those natural windows of opportunity that are just from either the interaction you have or the threats you have being so efficient or from the opposing decks being a little bit clunky. So... Why do you play a tempo deck? I mean, I, I so I played a lot of uh, like blue white Delver back in the day, not to show my my boomer stripes, um, but typically whenever and, and even like Legacy, I play the the Delver decks there too. And typically, you know, the reason to play a tempo deck is because you think those windows are going to be, you know really present you think a lot of the decks you're going to play against are going to give you the opportunity to get under them and you're going to be able to kind of poke a hole uh and and get through it you know there's room to take advantage of of that i think that spirits and pioneer especially around uh the rc in dallas you know just a few months back was a perfect example of there being room because people were, you know, they were getting really into exploring the enigmatic incarnation decks and, you know, ley line binding decks and, uh, you know, pi- like Rakdos was, was present, but mono green was also um, getting big. And so it was Lotus field. And all these decks are ones where they kind of need some setup and also their best cards are ones with the exception of Rakdos, but their best cards are ones that are really susceptible to a well-placed piece of interaction. And the Spirit's game plan is really good there. So why would you choose to play a tempo deck? Because, right, because you see that window open in a lot of decks and you think you're going to have that opportunity in a lot of your matchups. And I think, you know, especially in formats like, you know, like Pioneer, like Modern, where a lot of decks operate under the similar rules of engagement, you find that window, you know, more often than it seems, even if... You know, it feels like, oh, like, you know, there's no days, there's no force of will. How can I be a tempo deck? Which is cards that historically have been the backbone of that. Um, at least to me, that's like, that's the reason to really get into it is because you think that you don't need those cards. There are other cards that are going to take advantage of what you're seeing kind of be a natural weak point in uh, in a lot of decks in the format. But I, I don't know how you feel about Mason. So. No, I think you hit the nail on the head. I don't have anything to add, actually. <laughs> It does sort of, you know, and I think you also kind of covered like the role of a tempo deck, right? Um, And sort of you're seeing something that's exploitable and you are looking to exploit that and you sort of think that you have the cards that can do that, right? And one of the things about tempo decks is they are typically pretty hard and they are so hard and we don't see players gravitate through them as much. Uh, when they're not sort of the actual best thing to be doing because of their difficulty, because it is really hard to understand, is this a card I need to care about right now with the context of my hand versus is this a card I can ignore? And that changes almost every single game, right? Abe and I could be playing a little, you know, hammers versus rhinos, and I might want to force negation uh, this forge anew in some games, but not another, right? Or inversely, I might want to dead gone, a expositional in this game, but maybe not in another, right? And sort of understanding what are you trying to do? Is this thing I actually care about? Can I just fight around it, right? Is a really hard uh, thing to consistently do and is actually, I, I believe, very draining over the course of a big tournament. And that's why these things are so hard is you don't have cards that are typically running over your opponent, right? There are often like a card in each deck or in a tempo deck that 
allow you to sort of run someone over and allow for some sort of errors, right? So I think a lot of people think of Curious Obsession for the Spirits decks in Pioneer as a card where it's like, yeah, if you get that going, you can be a little sloppy with what card you're trading because as long as you protect the Curious Obsessed creature, you're going up to you're going up a card every turn, right? And you're applying a, a more pressure. And so you can do that sort of thing. And Rhinos, I, I sort of think Fury and the Force of Vigor type cards against the decks where those are good is how it does that. But, you know there's some amount of wiggle room when you have some cards that just raw overpower the opponent, right? But typically tempo decks don't have that. It's about lining your cards up correctly. And, you know, that makes it really hard. If you play four color, you can just solitude stuff, right? And you can just lay on binding prismatic ending. These universal answers to everything will figure it out and you can solve any problem. Uh, and it, sometimes you can even get it wrong, but it's okay because your cards are so redundant. With tempo decks, you know, sometimes... You need to spell pierce. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. You need to hold the spell pierce, not spell pierce early, because there's a specific card you're weak to with this hand that maybe you're not normally weak to, and you can beat this card. You know, so I know that's very vague and very nebulous, but I, I'm just trying to get home just how challenging these things actually are when you're playing them, and especially across like a 14, 15 round tournament, it becomes incredibly taxing and incredibly challenging. Yeah, and I think that you know to call back to um, the idea of the tempo attrition spectrum like which is easier to which is a stronger card right uh four four trampling rhino token or omnath right omnath will make it so that even two four fours is often just completely blanked um or at least two four fours as good as one omnath and that's just it if i'm playing one land every turn and doing nothing else like we're on pretty even foot because i'm gaining four and you're dealing me eight and i'm attacking you for four it's an even race omnath is just that good right so as a tempo deck you're not really going to get access to a card like omnath that's something that is the the privilege of choosing to try to win on a more uh you know by by overpowering and out muscling your opponent rather than out maneuvering so you know that makes it more difficult it's uh right you're playing with a lower cap on how strong your deck can be and you're you're not winning an arms race. You're trying to win, you know, decisively and quickly before they can do something that outclasses you. And while your cards are still of equal um, of equal power level, and that means also that you need to figure out how much you can really let slide if it's a permission based tempo deck. You know, if you're um, you know, figuring out what really matters and, and what matters more time or the specific kinds of cards can matter matchup to matchup, draw to draw. Um, and it, like you said, Mason, it can be really taxing and it's a lot to, lot to think about and know about kind of how the game is going to play out from the very beginning, right? You're start, you're talking, you're talking about a small window of the game that you're trying to take advantage of especially in the early game where you're going to be able to outpace your opponent. And that means you have to have a lot of like uncertain foresight about, well, what might happen on turn four or five that is going to matter? You know, what, what, what is it that I need to right? What are the risks I can afford to take? And what are the ones I need to make sure I'm covered by? In addition to the fact that you're already right. You're not a fast aggro deck. Your threats aren't, Right, if, if you were just an aggressive deck, you wouldn't really have to think about interacting with the opponent. Um, right, you would just be trying to to aggro them out. But you're also not a control deck, and you're not an attrition deck. So you're kind of occupying this middle space, and it's a lot to balance. And it it is taxing, but also when it's good, it's really rewarding. When you make those correct decisions, it just it adds up to some wins that not only are pretty, you know, they feel pretty impressive, but they are like you know the the summation of a lot of really really you know good decisions or things lining up really well and the deck f like firing all cylinders so it is really difficult but the reward like the juice is very worth the squeeze uh when when you get there in my opinion i agree and let's talk about that real quick to wrap things up here is how do tempo decks historically line up well with the rest of the format and to sort of be looking for that juice to be squeezing I mean, I'll, I'll talk about Delver a little bit more in that standard format because Delver was, you know, a it was dominant. Um, it was like they, the deck was always, even its bad matchups, it was still like at least a coin flip on the play to win a game because Delver of Secrets, Mana Lake, Geist Saint Draft, 
was just a curve that was like really hard to beat. You know, vapor snagging and snap casting vapor snag, and especially with the Delver secrets and play living, it was just it's so much to get around. And the thing that really made it so that deck uh, was so dominant was that after sideboarding, they didn't have to remain in that space. The threats and the and the cards at you know low enough mana value in the in like blue and white. And like especially things like Restoration Angel, Blade Splicer, the kind of value that could be generated for low amounts of mana uh, was really high. And so they could sideboard into a way that their deck was able to then play a more attrition game against decks that might try to play, uh, you know, something on the same lines as where they started. And that flexibility really is what made them dominant so while typically tempo decks like even mono blue and standard um like around the time of rc san diego um that kind of has right it had its own role where it was kind of defined by what draws it had um like there was like talarian terror draws and haughty gin draws and all of those were checks on the format but um like really what kind of checks you have on the format and how much range you can you can have to find when these are the best decks versus when they're just just providing good checks on the format in terms of how the rules of engagement are playing out. I think that when you like to, to sum it up in just one sentence, the tempo deck is the check on you know the development of the game. Sometimes there are control decks that are checks on the aggro decks or ramp decks that are checks on the control decks by like, can you beat me just hard casting a little mog at some point? Like, no, you can't handle the fact I'm going to have this cast trigger. Your deck is not uh, able to, to handle that. Well, too bad. But the tempo deck is really saying, can you deal with a deck that's going to get on board in this time frame and protect its board a couple of times? And if that's too much, then, you know, your deck has failed to check. And so, uh, at least that's how I see it. But I think that when you go back and look at the tempo decks over the years, that's really a lot of the equation. Yeah, I, I think that maybe the way I would sum it up for like if I had to make it a, a TLDR of kind of what I'm feeling you say and how I feel it, and correct me if you disagree here, is that a lot of what I'm looking for is for my cheap answers and my cheap threats to line up well against what the format is doing. If my answers don't line up well, then, you know, I'm not very excited to play the deck. If my creatures don't line up well, I'm not very excited to play the deck. I want them both to line up well. And maybe the exception being sort of if combo decks are really rampant. Typically, you can sort of just shove in a bunch of, you know, spell pierce type cards. But ideally, I want both my creatures to be something that is hard to interact with and frustrating for my opponents. And I want my answer spells and my interaction to be frustrating for them in a serious way. And if those things line up, I'm incredibly happy. Spirits versus Monogreen, I think, is the best example I can think of of this ever happening in my time in Magic of all the creatures are basically unblockable. Uh, some of them have very frustrating effects against what you're trying to do. All of my interaction spells are incredibly strong, and you have very few cards that actually matter, which makes my interaction spells even better. And when that is happening, that is when I am the happiest playing these tempo decks. Yeah, and when that is like the case across all sorts of decks. Like, when you look at formats like Legacy, where, you know, the threats are as good as they can be, basically, and the interaction is as good as it can be, basically. Uh, those decks are so dominant, and there were just years and years and years where the only thing really to play was Delver decks, because every other deck was susceptible in some form to, you know, here's some Spell Pierces and Dazes and Force of Wills, backed up by some pressure, and, like, you know, I can Lightning Wolf a creature here and there, or I can... You know, force a will of a green sun zenith and keep all my problems away um right everything lined up as being weak to both the interaction when it was backed up by a clock and as the threats have gotten stronger that's all changed yeah the right? threats the, have gotten the stronger and gone. the other colors got free spells as well right For yeah a long time it was sort of days and force will not only the best in class they were also the cheapest and now things like solitude fury Etc. are changing that dynamic and you know unholy heat type cards etc. So yeah yeah and, and all of that just goes to say that that's the, that's exactly the kind of positioning for your deck to be a dominant tempo deck or a tempo deck that's like you know really really good is you want to feel like in a bunch of matchups the way that things are playing out 
like favors towards your interactive spells. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you're able to write that window is always going to be there. Every game where that window is there, you should be favored. And in the matchups where the window's not there, right? Like against an efficient mid range deck, like scam or like, uh, like in modern or, um, like Rakdos in pioneer, uh, for these examples, like those are some of your harder matchups because they're able to play ball with you. They're, they're looking to play in that space, not only because they need their things to be efficient to continue interacting in most of their matchups, but because right, their threats need to be efficient, their, uh, their interaction needs to be efficient, even if it's not as efficient as yours or as efficient as it could be, it's as effective as ever, and, and it's not going to be the most attrition deck. It's not going to you know, tr- be trying to go over the top of everyone in a resource war, but it's certainly going to go over the top of you, a deck that's not trying to engage in that game at all. So, yeah, like, but if in most of your matchups, there's a window like that there where you can you can get through it, that's going to be the perfect time, and that's how you want to line up. And that's where tempo decks that have succeeded, they tend to line up in formats where, on average, things are a little bit clunky, um, right? There's room for you to, to have your, your time to get through, and, uh, and it all comes together. That's going to do it for this week's main topic. Hopefully this was helpful for you. Tempo decks are some of the most fun decks, I think, when they are uh, great but uh, not dominant. You know what I mean? Uh, Sometimes it can be a frustrating play experience for some players. But I really enjoy playing both against and with these kind of decks. And hopefully this was helpful to you if you're someone new or trying to get into Magic and kind of understand what tempo is. I guess it's worth saying this real quick, Abe, actually. is Sometimes people will say that was a high-tempo play. And what they're talking about is what we described at the beginning, cards in exchange for time, right? So if you tap out and play a Shieldred and I like crack my treasure and Fatal Push it, that's a, you know, a low mana exchange. And then I sort of got a high tempo type play, even though the card is permanently gone. That's typically what players are referring to. Not always because I would, uh, I don't know about you, but I think tempo is probably the most not universally understood and misused word in Magic. Uh, but I don't know how you feel about that. I, I mean, I, I think that's pretty true. I think it's it's really difficult because what you're describing, like that shouldered treasure fatal push play or whatever, that is a really efficient mana exchange, and that does generate a lot of, like, advantage, right? That, that turns a lot of, and even a tempo, it's a tempo swing where you're able to now do more things in that turn, and you've done more with your time than your opponent's done with their time, and you've taken away the efforts of their right of their investment but for me tempo really does have to be linked to that concept of time it can't just be an efficient interaction because for example if it's turn you know turn 10 and you play shieldred and i have a treasure and a fatal push in my hand and i use the treasure to revolt the fatal push but that's the only card i have left was that really a good tempo play like if if you have six mana eight mana you know and, and the same sequence occurs is that really a strong tempo play because for me it seems like and in general right what makes it a strong tempo play is that you tapped out you used your whole turn to do this and i answered your whole turn i undid your efforts in a very efficient way and i think that you know at its core tempo decks are decks that do that they undo their opponent's efforts in a very efficient way while also presenting a clock no that's a great clarification i did not make that as clear as i thought uh, and thank you for catching that so the listeners uh, can learn from that moment because I do agree wholeheartedly. Anyways, that is it for the main topic. Uh, if you want to find us, you can go to Twitter. Uh, sometimes people call it a different name, but Twitter, at uh, CCMTG. Uh, you can find Spencer, who's not here this week, at Spencer13H. You can also find him with the rest of the network, Need to Nerd, the podcast about nerd culture, and then Drafting Archetypes, another show on the network. Uh, that is one is by Sam Black and is all about limited. And there's a lot of really great stuff there, including the concept that we talked earlier about tempo to attrition spectrum. And so if you want to hear more of that, you can definitely go check that out. Sam Black is one of the best magic minds in the game. And you just get weekly 30 minutes of Sam Black's conscious stream directly to you. Abe, if someone wants to find you, where can they go? Uh, they can find me at twitter.com slash more nothings. Yeah, my, my DMs are still open for coaching. Uh, you can also email me at morenothings at gmail.com um, for inquiries, and we can set something up. Uh, how about you, Mason? You can find me over at twitter.com with Mason E. Clark. You can find me at twitch.tv slash the Mason Clark. I am here. I'm set up. The internet's great, Abe. You know, I've got like 
50 up or whatever, so I'm ready to stream a bunch uh, as soon as I get through this sort of uh, crazy week of coaching, which if you're interested in getting coaching, I do have some spots still available right now. Uh, October is getting pretty booked up, but you can reach out to me on Twitter, where the same at I just mentioned, or at my Gmail, which is masoneclark at gmail.com. Put coaching in the description that way. I know that it is about that and not spam. And you can find me each and every week over at Card Kingdom writing about something. This week, I'm actually going to be breaking down the RC results from both the EU and Canada, where, you know, our friend Misplaced Ginger actually just top it again, then pop forward again, Abe, to go to the Pro Tour again. It's all he does over there in Canada. So congratulations to him. But we're going to be breaking all that down over there. And you can find me each and every week here on CCMTG where you can support the show over at patreon.com slash ccmtg, like we talked about earlier in the show. Abe, hey, what did you learn this week? I learned that you've been playing scales, and that also we both think that it's a bad call of the deck, which is so good. To know. I felt so like crazy being like, why am I playing Cauldron? This card does not seem that good right now in the way this deck is built. But so many people were winning with the same copy paste lists and the challenges and, and putting up numbers with it that I was like, maybe there's something to it, but I'm glad I'm not alone. Yeah, I, I definitely think that deck is strong. It, it's just, I don't know, it's so hard to play. And I think also it's so hard to play against, right? Like, I have watched plenty of my opponents do things they could have won. And I was like, oh, you don't understand how modular works with like the Ozolith or whatever. That's understandable or whatever. I'm curious if you would have lost this game if you had known that. You know what I mean? And they just like make an attack and then blah, 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 20 you and you're dead. Um, <laughs> uh, the thing I learned this week uh, was actually really the tempo to attrition spectrum uh, that we had talked about. I hadn't really internalized it and processed it before and I really like it. And I think that's a, a great way to look at things. So that one was a great one for me to sort of hear and learn about. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of Constructor Criticism. We'll be back next week with another episode of CCMTG.